Hello, folks. Welcome to our Meet the Candidate session. Today, we're happy to have Commissioner Mingus Maps here with us. We're just going to take a quick second to let everyone log in and get settled, and then we'll get started. Okay, I think I'm going to start rolling here um, because we've got an hour. I want to respect that everyone's lunchtime so we can finish up on time. And then as people log in, um, they can just join. And just for everyone's info, just like our other Meet the Candidate sessions, we're going to have this recorded. If you've got people in your, uh, in your networks that are unable to come today and they want to catch up with what we've talked about, you can direct them to our Impact Northwest YouTube channel. And we'll have this recording up just like with all our other ones. We'll have them up. We'll have that this recording up within the next day or two. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, our, our, our candidate today for the mayor of Portland, Commissioner Mingus Maps. Please join me in welcoming Mingus Maps. I'm the moderator for the session, and my name is Mike Tierney. I'm the advocacy program manager at Impact Northwest. And also, we've got on board hosting with us a number of Portland area nonprofits doing great work in our community. We've got a special thank you to our nonprofit partners, uh, Portland Tenants United, Blanche House, SEI, Northwest Pilot Project, Half Home Transition Projects, um, and uh, give me one second here. I've I've lost some some information I was looking at. Uh, Portland Tenants United, Path Home, William Temple House, Transition Projects, RGS Future, and all the rest of the folks that were able to help join us today on the call. We really appreciate it. Um, and so just to go over a couple of uh, ground rules and stuff, um, we're going to like have all participants um, treat each other with respect. And as we would uh, like to be treated, we're going to have the microphones off during um, during the during the talking. But if you do have questions, we'll have a Q&A period at the end. And um, you can either raise your hand physically on the on the on the camera here or you can use the in, in the reactions icon section at the bottom of your screen. You can do the raise your hand there and we will unmute you for your questions or you can put them in the chat. And we also have a couple of questions that might have come in earlier into our portal. So um, as I said, we do have the recession uh, recorded. And with that, I think we can start. Um, we're gonna have a few minutes for Commissioner Maps to speak, um, and then we will open up the floor for questions. So Commissioner Maps, thanks so much for taking the time. It's very busy for you, I'm sure. We're about five weeks away from the election. So we appreciate you taking the time out today for lunch. Well, thanks, Mike. And I'm delighted to be here today. I want to thank you, Impact Northwest, and all the other sponsors who helped put uh, together today's important conversation. Um, I know we got a lot of service providers on the line, too. I want to thank all of you for the work that you do around homelessness and housing. That's truly really, uh, the most important issue, I think, facing our city today. Um, I suspect a lot of you folks know me, uh, but for those of you who don't, let me take a couple of minutes to introduce myself and then let's get right into, I hope, a dialogue. Um, hi, my name is Mengus Maps. Um, I'm currently one of your commissioners on Portland City Council. On council, I've been your infrastructure guy, so I'm, I've am i been the commissioner in charge of roads, water, and environmental services. Um, obviously, I'm here before you today because I'm also a candidate for mayor. But before we get into the policy stuff, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I have deep roots in Portland, had family here for my entire life. I uh, did my undergraduate work at Reed College, um, then went on to get a PhD in government from Cornell University. Um, academically, I've split my career between being, or professionally, I've split my career between being an academic, where I've taught on issues around uh, inequality, public policy, and often race. 
And um, I've also been a public servant here in Portland. Uh, going way back, I actually used to work for the chair of Multnomah County, Beth Stein. Also have worked for United Way um, at the city of Portland. I used to uh, help help run the city's neighborhood association system. And I was a supervisor in the crime uh, prevention program. And for the last several years, um, I have uh, served on city council. Uh, but I'm here before you today because I'm running for mayor. Um, and whenever I tell people I'm running for mayor, I get uh, the same question, although it, it tends to take two different flavors. And that question is, Mengus, why are you running for mayor? Why would you do that to yourself? Uh, is one version of the question. Um, and, you know, I'm running for mayor because, frankly, um, yeah, number one, public service is the highest calling that I can imagine. Um, I've always drifted towards doing public policy because, frankly, I think our hardest and most important problems tend to um, drift towards the public space. Otherwise, they'd be dealt with by the private sector. Um, that's also one of the reasons why I tend to do local government. Um, where we all feel government most tangibly is at the local level. You know, when do you actually inter interact with someone from the government? Uh, it's typically not someone from the federal government. It's someone from your local government, your firefighters, your cops, your park rangers, uh, your school teachers, so on and so forth. So this is here at the local level. The work that we do on the ground is the work that really uh, transforms people's lives. Um, now, the second version of the question is, you know, Mengus, what basically what do you want to accomplish when you're mayor of Portland? <clears throat> and my answer to that will come as no surprise. I think all Portlanders have a fairly um, common set of top priorities, and those include public safety, houselessness, and economic recovery. Um, this might be a little bit controversial um, in front of this audience, but uh, I'll tell you, um, <clears throat> especially having been a crime prevention coordinator or a supervisor um, at the city not that long ago, I think one of our main challenges we face at the city is that, you know, we're understaffed in the police bureau. Uh, you'd expect a city of our size to have about 1,200 police officers. We have currently today, I think, about 801 um, that's why when you call 911 and a cop doesn't show up or they show up after several hours, it's because we just literally don't have the resources to get them to uh, get them to your house or your place of business. I also want to emphasize that, you know, just because we need to right size the police department doesn't mean um, that accountability is not important. Um, indeed, you can probably notice that I'm a person of color. I'm also the dad of uh, two teenage boys and accountability and transparency and fairness in policing is uh, literally um, in some cases, a life and death issue for my family, as it is for many families here in Portland. So I both want to grow the size of the police bureau, but I also want to make sure that we have a police bureau that is fair and accountable. I also think that there are many other ways to keep uh, our city safe. Uh, so Portland Street Response plays an important role there. Violence prevention programs play an important role there. Having healthy and strong communities play an important role there. Um, and that's the kind of leadership I'll bring to the public safety space. Now, I know our main issue today is likely to surround housing and uh, homelessness. Um, and it's an incredibly important uh, issue. I think it, that uh, our housing crisis basically defines the very quality of life here in Portland. Um, I was just out uh, running for meetings meetings today and all across our city, Northeast, South and West, as you know, <clears throat> there are tents of people in dire need our top priority has to move has to be moving people from uh, the sidewalks um, into safe and stable housing. Uh, my goal as your mayor is to um, cut our houseless population in half by the end of 2025. That sounds ambitious, but actually that is the plan the city and the county currently have on the table. I believe that we can reach that goal. Um, how? Well, number one, I think that we actually have a great model in our safe rest villages. We're finding that as we move people from sidewalks into our safe rest villages, um, after a couple of months, they're able to stabilize. One of the things that we really need to do um, after a couple of months is to move fo folks from those safe rest villages into supportive housing. In order to get that work done, we need to have a good partner over at uh, Multnomah County. As you all know, we've had uh, rich conversations with the county about how we can coordinate better together. And I hope that we can unpack that as we um, as we get into the Q&A part of our discussion this evening. I also want to tell you, I am a big believer in Port Portland Street response. Um, you know, um, I was actually here as we set it up. 
I was in charge of uh, the Bureau of Emergency Communications as we were taking that from a pilot program out in Linz to a citywide uh, service right now. Um, I think this is what modern, what a modern public safety system looks like. I continue to uh, look forward to helping that program grow and evolve. Um, and uh, frankly, in order to um, to reach our goals in the houselessness space, I'm going to need the partnership and counsel of, frankly, everyone on this call. So I look forward to those dialogues. And finally, let's talk about economic recovery. Um, we have just lived through a remarkable moment here in the city of Portland. You know, our uh, town has been around for about 175 years. And in that time, we've only lost population, I believe, about two or three times. Um, and one of those times has been basically the current moment. We're actually seeing families and businesses leave Portland. That is not something which happens often. It's literally a once in a century uh, development. Um, and frankly, it's an unsustainable development. And we know why people are leaving and we know why businesses are leaving. You know, both the psychic and the economic cost of doing business in Portland are just too high. Uh, City Hall has to take a leading role in turning that around. You know, here's what I think that we can do. Number one, you know, frankly, if you want to live in Portland or if you want to grow a business in Portland, uh, livability and safety on our streets is a key issue. That's what I hear over and over again from the businesses who used to be downtown or in other parts of our city and are fleeing to the suburbs. Uh, so we have to do a better job at the city of cleaning up graffiti, cleaning up garbage, making sure that uh, people are safe in their homes and their businesses. Another factor, and I'm sure a lot of you who have uh, tried to set up housing or shelters know that our permitting system is a nightmare um, that drives up the cost of doing any kind of development in the city. That's why during my entire time on council, I have um, helped lead a, um, a group that's reforming our permitting system. We've made important progress there. Um, but we need to do much, much better. Um, I'll continue that work. Frankly, if you have to wait uh, weeks to months to years to get your permits out, it just makes it untenable to build housing in this town. And we desperately need to build more housing um, in this town. So those are my three issues. I'm sure that has probably raised more questions uh, um, than I've answered, but um, I look forward to unpacking uh, your concerns and uh, in our Q&A session, which um, I'm ready. Uh, Mike, if you're ready, I'm ready. Thanks, Commissioner Maps. Appreciate it. And sure. uh, while we get, you know, folks getting ready to use the chat or raise their hands for questions, I'll just open with a couple of things. One of note, uh, I apologize. I uh, had a little gremlin in my computer and I lost some of my notes when I was doing the intro. So I don't want to leave this out. I wanted to say as a 501c3 group of nonprofits, we hear on this call, it's important to note we don't endorse any candidate. We do feel that civic engagement and advocating for the communities that we work in is important. And that's why we're all here. And then I also want to start the questioning with this, um, just our particular two-pronged approach at Impact Northwest is um, to, to stress the importance of housing plus services yeah. as a solution to addressing our housing crisis. And then the second part of it is uh, advocating for contract modernization that revamps the way the public sector contracts with nonprofits to provide housing services, specifically around the area of uh, a, how, um, a, a living wage for our frontline workers and all of our staff that are doing the job of helping to solve our homelessness crisis. So if I could open up with that, your thoughts on that commissioner uh, in regards to the contract modernization and the living wage for our staff. Uh, both make a lot of sense to me. Uh, listen, folks, I think we're on the same side here. We need to have um, a network, frankly, a continuum of services that helps keep people in place and move people from the sidewalks to the streets. I know this is literally some of the most challenging work uh, that exists in the Portland metro area. And the people who do this work deserve a living and fair wage. Um, most of those contracts, I believe, exist over at the county side. Uh, one of the things I've done since I've been on council and one of the things I'll do with the mayor, when I'm mayor is to uh, lobby our partners over at the county to pay you folks a, a fair and living wage. I know that we're not going to be able to provide stable services if you can't hold on to your staffs 
frankly, I lived through that as we tried to navigate the uh, COVID era, when for a variety of reasons, everyone, especially folks who were on, out um, on the streets, uh, directly serving clients were um, having a hard time holding on to staff. So fair wages, living wages are a key to making the system work. I'm happy to invest in that space. Um, and I will uh, emphasize that um, with the county chair, my partners at the county, when I'm your rare. Okay, in, in regards to the county, um, the the can you can you give us your idea, your thoughts on the uh, homelessness response plan that was released this summer? What you feel they did differently that we've done in the past, and what you feel still needs to be improved. Sure. Uh, that's a great question. Well, things I like in the plan are, you know, having some specific goals, having some specific metrics, having a uh, steering committee that kind of over oversees that work. Um, all of that is quite promising. Um, you know, plans are living documents, so we're going to have to see how um, our implementation goes. And frankly, Portland's great at plans, but we're terrible at implementing them. Um, I believe as soon as next week, the city and the county are going to come together to evaluate where we're at. Um, I will also be transparent with you. Uh, one of the things that we had um, thought we resolved when we put together this proposal was a framework for how the city and the county can come together to um, coordinate this work. And I think we already have some challenges in that space. You know, on the city side, I think we were very hopeful that the steering committee would serve as a... Um, a policy making group. Um, and I think the county views the steering committee as more of an advisory board. I feel like we're a little bit stuck and stymied on that, uh, but we'll continue to have these dialogues. Um, let me also be clear, there's, um, there's no way to solve homelessness if the city and the county don't continue to work together. Um, however, one of the observations I have is that the city and the county, and frankly, this falls on leadership. Uh, has failed to, to develop the mechanisms that we need to uh, coordinate our services. My plan and my proposal is that we just have very clear contracts for what the city does and what the county does um, in the houselessness space. Frankly, I'm shocked that we don't have a clean and clear IGA on this. Um, as your infrastructure guy, I work with the county all the time on everything from bridges to vector control. And we have very clear contracts that say, you know, who does what and how the money flows. Uh, houselessness, in my observation, is the only space where um, we tend to just wing it. And uh, the fact that we wing it um, is one of the reasons that I think uh, so many of you are struggling so much. Uh, so I want to clean that up. I believe that we can clear, clear that up. And if once we do have a clear assessment of who does what and we spell that out on paper and sign the agreements, I think that's the first step for us to make uh, some real meaningful progress. Can you just clarify the IGA acronym? Oh, intergovernmental agreement. So it. it's basically the contract between the city and the county uh, that defines how the joint office works. And um, even on a fundamental issue like that, at this hour, we still seem to have um, some disagreement, which is remarkable because we spent three years negotiating how the, these gears would come together. Okay. Um, one of our audience members had a question in the chat just as I was asking mine, and they're Pretty much the same question so it's okay. obviously on a lot of our minds it's about the homelessness response action plan and she, brenda was just asking in addition to what i was asking uh is the 50 percent reduction is that also specifically laid out in the a trap uh, i believe yes it is okay. so i think that's one of our one of our expectations so it's my understanding that uh, given the plans that we put together um, and the homelessness action plan by the end of 2025, we will cut uh, the number of folks who are sleeping on our streets in half. I know that's a tall order. Um, I'm gonna be optimistic that we can achieve that. And I'll tell you, um, although it's a tall order, I think there's reason for optimism here. You know, I think we have north of 666 uh, um, beds in our safe rest village system. We're finding that after people go into those spaces and stay for about 90 days, they're ready. Um, they're ready to move on to uh, more stable housing, supportive housing or whatnot. So if we can get that flow from the sidewalks to safe rest villages 
um, into supportive housing, I believe that we can actually see these numbers uh, decrease dramatically. Now, one of the challenges that we've faced in my time we've been on council is actually getting those uh, rental vouchers and those slots and supportive housing for our clients and our safe rest villages. You know, I think this is a place where having a clear contract between the city and the county about uh, the um, services that are going to be available to our Safe Rest Village clients, you know, would make that system uh, flow better and actually give us the throughput that we need to actually make a difference on our streets. Okay. Um, I was going to ask one more question about HRAP, and that is, do you see the, the, the sort of public accountability aspect of the dashboard as being something that's important? And how do you see that as being rolled out so far? Um, yes, I'm a big fan of dashboards. I'm a data-driven guy. As I mentioned before, I have a PhD in government. I literally tried to build systems uh, that that pencil out in a, in a spreadsheet. The, uh, the dashboards are incredibly important for that. I will also tell you, I find these dashboards to be not particularly meaningful for me as a policy maker now. They provide very broad uh, information about the number of people we served in the last quarter. What I can't do as a policy maker is look at this spreadsheet, look at those dashboards and see how did we do last month or what's the relationship between these investments that we made in the first quarter and the number of people who are sleep, uh, sleeping on our streets. Um, I think that uh, the folks who have pulled those together um, need to refine uh, the data they are making available because while dashboards are important, the dashboards that we have there now are not a meaningful policy making tool, but eventually they will be. And frankly, um, I believe that we can solve our houselessness problems and most of the problems that face our city if we take um, a data oriented approach to the work we're trying to do. Okay, thanks. Um, I have a question from RJ coming up on the chat. What are your thoughts and opinions on Oregon's rent cap controls, as well as the city of Portland, Portland's renters relocation assistance program for no cause evictions? Would you make any changes uh, to renter protections as mayor? Sure. Great question, R.S. I'm just looking at your notes uh, in my uh, I'm looking at your notes right now. Um, I support rent control, especially rent control at the state level. One of the things that happens when the state passes rent control is that it uh, places limits on what uh, the city of Portland is able to do. Uh, so the, the state uh, rules broadly in this space. Um, um, so I think it's it plays an important role here. Certainly, um, I would be more than willing to continue to look at the space and advocate at the uh, down in Salem for improvements to that program. Um, you know, renter relocation um, assistance strikes me as also being um, an appropriate um, an appropriate re um, resource for uh, f folks who are renting. So I think that's an important tool in our tool chest too. Okay. Uh, this one is for from Deanna. I appreciate your stance on more shelter with wraparound services and affordable housing being built. I hear daily from walk-ups and emails and calls uh, about the heavy need for rent assistance. Yeah. This is one of the major gaps in services, uh, an upstream preventative resource for rent assistance. And what is your proposed solutions to keep people in housing and to ensure that rents are affordable? for our financially vulnerable community members so that the flow from housing and homelessness, housing to homelessness is decreased? Sure, great question. You know, rental assistance is clearly one of the keys to both uh, getting people off the streets and keeping people in their house, uh, in their current housing situations. You know, frankly, one of the things I was doing uh, too late last night was looking at other cities that have had been successful in dramatically reducing the number of people who sleep on their streets and rental assistance has been a key to that. Um, you know, frankly, one of the things I want to clearly spell out um, in my, uh, in my relationship with the county is uh, when and where and how our clients and our safe rest villages are able to access rent assistance. You know, frankly, if you go into one of our safe rest villages and you succeed in the program, one of the guarantees I want to be able to make to you is that at the end of that process, there's going to be a rental voucher for you out, out there. Right now, frankly, that has been an inconsistent um, thing, uh, but 
we will not succeed if we cannot guarantee that. And I'll tell you that whole safe rest village experiment collapses if it becomes permitted housing. You know, if it's transitional housing from the sidewalks into more stable, um, into more stable settings, we're going to make progress towards moving people off the streets. If our safe rest villages and our clients are not able to access rental vouchers, frankly, that just becomes a new form of permitted housing, uh, which is a good thing. However, uh, we still leave thousands of people on the streets, and that's unacceptable. Hey, let's go to Laura. She has her hand raised in the on the on the on video here. Hi, hey, Laura. Laura. Thanks for being so patient. Oh, no worries. Thank you, Commissioner Maps, for being here today. Thanks, Mike. Um, so, Commissioner, I wanted to ask you about your position about the joint office and yep. the relationship to it. Yep. You have said in the past that you think the joint office should be eliminated. And um, I'm I'm that causes me some concern. So I'm wondering if you could share with us what your current position is on that. And if you could expand a little bit more to talk about what you envision as sure. being the ideal relationship between the city and the county when it comes to comprehensive, coordinated, strategic, execution and delivery of services to people who are currently homeless, at risk of homelessness, how that ties with HRAP, how that ties with the supportive housing services measure, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, great question, Lauren. I think it gets uh, to the heart of the work that's ahead of us. First, let me be clear. You know, we need to have uh, the city and the county need to work together in order to solve houselessness. Um, um, there's no way around that. Um, and I'll tell you, in my experience, the way, one of the ways in which it plays out, the city ha has lots of employees who are out on the streets interacting with uh, folks who are um, houseless. Um, my goal as your next mayor is, is to make sure that every time a city employee interacts with a citizen or a resident who needs help, uh, especially in the housing space, we can uh, do a warm handoff to the county in order to hook them up with services. Um, um, you know, and I think that I view the city as maintaining the physical or physical built city and uh, the county is providing mental health services and a lot of those other social services which are outside the realm of what the city does. And one of the reasons why it's outside the realm of what the city does is state and federal funds for houselessness and mental, uh, mental health care and just health care flow to the county as opposed to the city. So even if it was our top priority as a city, we do not have the resources that the county does to make this work. Um, you know, one of the things that we've also seen with the joint office is we came together years ago to kind of form a relatively informal um, entity, which is the joint office, which is supposed to coordinate city service or houselessness services. Now, there, there was always something a little bit I think disingenuous about at least the name of the joint office. It implies that the city and the county both run this thing. And it's very much, it's clear, like the joint office is a county project. Um, you know, our current dilemma, for example, around whether or not the steering committee for the joint office is an advisory group, uh, which the county, which is the county's position, or a policy making group, which is the city's position, is a symptom of this kind of frankly, dysfunction that exists in this space. Now, my position here is not that um, the city and county shouldn't work together. I do think on the city side, we um, are deeply invested in kind of a delusional position that this is, uh, we are equals in this space, and we just aren't. 80% of the um, joint office funding comes from someplace other than the city. I'm very happy to continue to invest invest in this work, but uh, the fact that we can't uh, cut, we've yet we've yet to come up with a mechanism for truly coordinating and making policy uh, implies that, it, frankly, I think the city needs to get clearer here. And I understand and I respect all the all the sort of policy expertise that's over there. You know, that's why, you know, I want the city and the county to work together. And I, the joint office is a great place for this to happen. But I think when we sit down to describe how this office works, we need to clearly specify what the city does and what the county does. You know, so I'm happy to make investments in this space. And right now, frankly, I think moving forward, we're probably in, in the space where the city is likely to invest 
north of $20 million a year in the joint office, uh, which represents a, a tiny fraction of all the funds that are available to the joint office. But I do think for that $26 million, let's say, we should have some pretty clear agreements on what the county's going to buy with that. And frankly, you know, where we do touch uh, folks who are living out on the streets, specifically, let's say in our Safe Rest Village system, you know, I sure hope that we can have an agreement on how people, how we can create a continuum of services between, you know, the villages that we set up and the more stable housing and healthcare services that the county provides. Laura, is that responsive? May not be satisfactory, but is it responsive? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I was looking for the unmute button. Yeah, sure. yes, thank you, no. Commissioner Maps. Really appreciate that. No problem. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. And I have a next question from Terrell about the um, the budget. Is it the budget that's holding back the police department hiring issues or qualified applicants, combination of both? What do you see that? What do you see oh. as the issues there and how to solve it? Well, I'll tell you, there has been um, a true revolution um, in Portland in terms of police hiring. When I came into office three and a half years ago, we all know cops were leaving in droves and we couldn't, frankly, um, hire folks. Um, now, uh, Portland is doing better um, than most cities in America in terms of recruiting new police officers. However, you know, uh, it takes about 18 months to uh, train up a police officer, and that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, so we're doing great in hiring. If you haven't been to a swearing-in ceremony uh, for new police recruits I, and you care about the space, I encourage you to go. We do them every couple of weeks, uh, typically downtown. Uh, what you'll see is, you know, a, a, a group of young people, a group of diverse people, a group of, frankly, deeply progressive people uh, wanting to join the police force here in Portland. And I also kind of want to reassure folks, um, you know, if you want to be a bad cop, there are plenty of cities in America where you can go do that. The people who are choosing to make their law enforcement career in Portland really are invested in um, a 21st century approach to uh, public safety work, which means, you know, community building, problem solving, uh, you know, respecting equity issues. I'm very excited about the work that we're, do we're doing in this space. So it takes time. Um, one of the other issues here, though, is we have a relatively older police force. We have, you know, lots of retirements coming up. Uh, we're based, our police force had been kind of old, um, and those folks are beginning to retire. And as they retire, we're bringing on new folks. Uh, so we're kind of treading water a little bit right now. But over the next several years, I expect uh, the number of folk, our, the size of our police department to grow. I think before I mentioned uh, growing us to, uh, you'd expect us to have about 1,200 police officers given our size. I think that actually we don't need to build back to 1,200. I think with unarmed police forces, PSR, um, and other strategies, you know, we can make do with a much smaller police force than you'd expect us to have but clearly you know just look at response times for you know if you call 911 we're for, we're still taking far too long to get a car, cop car to you and that really is just a staffing issue and we we need to solve that i think if we can get to eight about 900 police officers uh we'll begin to actually really make a dent in how long it takes to get help to you when you need the help of a police officer Okay, um, we got now a question from Andy. Uh, as a shelter provider, we know shelter is a good temporary solution for some, but not for everyone. Some people struggle with the lack of privacy or yep. curfews and complying with the rules that are needed to enforce, uh, to make shelters work and the folks who want to be there. If we make camping illegal and don't have housing for everyone, what do we do as a community with the folks for whom shelter is not a viable option? Sure. Well, Andy, I I hear you on that. You know, I volunteered at a couple of um, a couple of shelters, especially in winter, and I know that they can be rough places to be. Doesn't surprise me at all that on most nights, especially when the weather weather is nice, uh, thousands of Portlanders choose to sleep outside as opposed to sleeping in a church basement um, or one of our permanent shelters. Um, however, you know, um, it is also the case that over in the city, and this is different from the county, over at the city, we have an obligation um, to maintain the right of way. 
You know, uh, people need to be able to navigate our sidewalks. Um, our roads need, need to be passable. Um, you know, this is, uh, our, the public space is truly a shared space and privatizing it, frankly, is deeply problematic. And not only is it deeply problematic, it's against federal law. Um, so when we have tents and other, uh, and other assets blocking our sidewalks, as you all know, the city gets sued, um, and then the city talks to the county about the need to work together in order to get this resolved. And frankly, I see very little difference uh, in this space. So, you know, my goal, and I think all of our goals should, is and should be to find enough shelter for everyone uh, who resides within the city limits. Uh, um, you know, I recognize that um, congregate shelter is not uh, for everybody. Um, that's one of the reasons why I'm so enthusiastic about our safe rest villages. Uh, they provide, you know, frankly, some privacy, some security, some a sense of autonomy, which I think everyone wants. Um, I think that's a great option. However, I, I don't think that um, a tent um, on West Burnside, um, you know, should ever be the housing solution for uh, folks in Portland. I don't think that's normal. I don't think it's humane. And I think it's awfully hard for people who are living in those situations like that to heal and do better. There's a follow-up on that, Commissioner, uh, sure. in regards to, you know, we mentioned some issues where a certain part of our population does not conform to these shelters. But what about graveyard shift workers that are experiencing homelessness or people with families, uh, you know, like other other options, other other ways to think about what to do instead of just shelters. Sure. Oh, my gosh. Well, um, you know, and you folks are on the front line. You know, frankly, I think one of the things that we have seen over the last several years is our customer base. And here we can think of our customers as being hassles folks um, are largely rejecting congregate shelter. Um, um, it's not a space that folks typically want to be in. I think that's one of the reasons why we as a community need to think creatively about alternative uh, sheltering models. Um, I there's a certain economic efficiency to uh, doing congregate shelter. Um, and that may make sense in a snowstorm or a heat wave or whatnot. Uh, but for the most part, it um, is not a great way for anyone to make it through their days. Um, so that's why I think we need to continue to kind of work together and figure out uh, new strategies for moving people from the sidewalks to the streets. I think safe, you know, safe rest villages are a great model. Um, you know, ultimately the solution is, you know, to move everyone into um, a more permanent and frankly, in most situations, probably supportive housing situation, which also means that we need to build more housing, which is the other aspect of my um, housing agenda. You know, um, one of the things that you consistently see, and I, I know I'm educating folks who know far more about this than I do, that um, as the cost of housing goes up, um, so does houselessness. So one of the things that I think we need to do is build more housing options here in Portland so that, uh, you know, people, there is a, a housing market or at least a segment of the housing market that can serve everybody. Uh, we've largely failed at that right now. You know, I think we need to bring on about 6,000 new housing units a year. I think this year we might be pretty close to about 2,000 housing units coming online. Um, that's deeply unacceptable. And one of the spaces where I know we really, really struggle is highly affordable housing, you know, housing for folks who make less than $50,000 a year. Um, and, you know, in this space, I think we're going to have to have significant investments from the public sector. Um, in some ways, the term um, affordable housing is a misnomer. Um, you know, housing is just expensive by the time you pay for the land, the materials and the labor to bring it online. Um, you know, what makes it affordable is the subsidy. And um, I'm deeply supportive of subsidizing um, highly affordable housing in particular, especially for most vulnerable Portlanders. Um, I think we've had great experience with that uh, through the housing bond. I'd like to see us uh, continue to use that strategy to bring affordable housing online um, every year. And I think we need to build about 3,000 units of highly affordable housing every year for the foreseeable future. Okay, that leads right into a um, question from RJ. I've I've read that you are part of the fifty percent of fifty three percent 
of Portlanders that own their own home, how how will you assure the other 47% of Portlanders who rent that you have their best interests in mind? What will you offer Portland renters so that one day they may be able to buy their first home? Sure. Uh, great question, RJ. Well, um, uh, well I, I am incredibly privileged to um, own or at least be in the process of trying to buy my own house. Uh, um, I'm hardly a rich person. Um, economic uh, challenges um, have been part of my life experiences. I have been part of my life experience. Um, and um, so I know how Portlanders live. I think that's actually one of the things that may distinguish me to a significant degree from many of the other folks um, in this race. In terms of folks who are renting now and aspire to buy, you know, I think you in particular, you know, that audience right there are, are some of the ones uh, who I hope will uh, take an interest in my in, in my uh, commitment to building more housing. You know, um, housing is a market, um, and as housing becomes more scarce, the prices go up. Uh, we know that we need to build at least six thousand units um, every year. We're dramatically underperforming that right now. So um, I'm deeply committed to making sure that we bring more of that housing online. Um, I do support the state's um, uh, rent caps. I think that makes that makes sense too. And we've already talked today about the importance of rental assistance, uh, which again has been key uh, to keeping people housed and reducing houselessness in um, the other cities around America that have particularly excelled at moving people from the streets um, into shelter. Okay. Uh, we had a question coming in from Carol on our portal before the call began. And it was in it was in relation to um prior prior uh, city problems with during during the protests and during COVID and BLM and the protests yep. that turned into riots and the 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 mayor issuing curfew warnings and then taking them away. And and the question is, how would you do that? How would you see handling those situations in the future versus riot, rioting, curfews, how to handle it, how to how to manage it better? Sure. Um, ironically, I think Commissioner Hardesty was actually, I think we only issued curfews once. And I think uh, it was when the mayor was out of town and Commissioner Hardesty was the, the presiding officer. Um, you know, I believe that, um, you know, Portlanders are free and should have the uh, right to be wherever they want to be when they where they need to be at. Um, on the other hand, you know, uh, vandalism and violence is fundamentally unacceptable. Um, you know, it um, it uh, causes damage to our city. Um, and frankly, uh, many of the folks who are taking the brunt of that of that uh anger, frankly, or just public servants who are trying to make sure that uh, people are safe. Um, you know, as an African American, I understand the importance and the absolute right for people to express their opinions. Um, so as your mayor, I got two kind of, I have two imperatives. On the one hand, I need to defend your right to free speech. And at the same time, I have to keep people and property safe. Um, I think we learned a lot um, during the events of the last several years. So under a mayor maps, uh, you know, you are not going to see a curfew. You're not going to see uh, smoke bombs being used. Uh, you're going to see an emphasis on de-escalation. Uh, you'll actually see me out there on the front lines, actually trying to engage in dialogue with folks. Um, you know, I think your your concerns here are largely with uh, leadership. Um, and when I'm your mayor, uh, the buck stops with me. So I will be open and available and in dialogue with the people of Portland around the issues they care about most. Um, and I will also be asking people and frankly, have the expectation that, you know, we won't uh, break windows, we won't set uh, buildings on fire, we won't assault public servants. I, I think that we can uh, both preserve our uh, civil rights and our speech rights while also um, while also uh, keeping people safe. Thanks, Commissioner. That that, that leads me uh, to another question I had, and that is um, communicating to the public in more effective manner, more maybe more creative ways so that we can feel that we are in touch with the plans. And that that's where I was getting at with the dashboard question. What yeah. I like about that is the accountability aspect of it. 
where any member of the public can go to find out the progress of what has been promised. Yep. And that is as well as, you know, working and communicating with whatever the county is supposed to be doing. As you mentioned, they have a lot of the purse strings and a lot of that funding has not been rolled out yet. And the public is becoming, uh, you know, aggravated about that. Yep. They want to see solutions and they feel like they paid for it. So can you speak with us about that and how, how you'll bring the communication to another level for the public? Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's why the dashboard is so important. Um, it holds, you know, not just the county, but also the city accountable for um, the work that we say we're going to do. Uh, frankly, especially in challenging spaces like homelessness, um, you know, failing to meet your goals, um, that's okay. As long as you learn from your mistakes and adjust uh, frankly, right now, our houselessness system is something of a black box. We kind of know um, how many dollars we put in every year. And, you know, once a year, we get a count of the number of folks who are out on our streets. Um, but, you know, that is not enough information to really evaluate what's happening and, frankly, where we can do better. Um, that's why I called for a more nuanced uh, dashboard than the ones we have up today. Um, but you'll certainly see uh, Amer Maps continue to push for and just literally demand. This is not actually um, something I'm willing to uh, let slide. We need to continue to have the dashboards up. I think they need to be more meaningful, more detailed dashboards. Um, I'd like to see at least monthly updates in terms of what's happening in this space. And then, you know, frankly, on top of this, um, you know, there's a dashboard piece to this. I think that one of the things that um our elected leaders and that certainly includes the mayor uh the the mayor your next mayor needs to be in dialogue with the people of portland about what we're doing to move people from the sidewalks into shelter and also to be straight up about where we need to do better and uh that's the kind of leadership i'll bring to this space okay um folks are there any more questions from the group uh in chat or raising your hands any other um Thoughts before we start to wrap up? Hi, Laura. Laura. Hi, I, I, I don't have another question, but I just wanted to go back to a question that RJ put in the chat really early about rent cap, which I think is a great question. It's right after Brenda's question. Thanks. So I think we might have touched on this a little bit. Um, you know, I support uh, rent control, especially the rent control that we have at the state. Um, I certainly would be um, open to hearing uh, thoughts that uh, Portlanders have on how we can make uh, the state's rules in this space more effective. Um, I will certainly advocate with our leadership down in Salem to uh, make those improvements where um, where we need. Um, I think RJ also asked about um, uh, relocation assistance, um, and I support relocation assistance for renters too. Okay, I think I think we've got another question. A um, couple more. RJ, as mayor, would you follow up? Uh, RJ is saying, as mayor, would you would you be able to make stronger rent caps for Portland. Uh, would you be able to make stronger rent caps for Portland? How would you do this? Um, RJ, it's my understanding that um, because of the way um, because of the way cities are nested within uh, the state or the road because of the relative powers of state government versus uh, city government, there's not a lot that the port the city of Portland can do uh, to strengthen our rent caps beyond what the state currently does. Um, in other words, in many spaces, state law preempts uh, local laws. Uh, we've explored what we can do in this space. And, and, and what I have heard from the experts in this field and our lawyers is that uh, the state's rules around uh, rent caps uh, trump any stronger provisions that we might want to do at the local level. Okay, and uh, how would uh, this is from Fabian? How would how will you support the education system in Portland? 
Uh, great question. I got two kids in high school, so this is near and dear to my heart. I will also tell you, as an academic, I know that one of the ways that you uh, build wealth in America, especially wealth for uh, people of color is through education and frankly, um, owning your own home. Uh, we've talked today a little bit about the home ownership piece, uh, which requires us to build more. And in terms of education, uh, that's the other piece that is incredibly important. Um, you know, at the city side, we've made major investments uh, through the Clean Energy Fund and helping support the physical infrastructure in that space. Um, I'll also tell you, um, as the former commissioner in charge of PBOT, we've worked very hard with the uh, very hard to provide our schools with um, safe routes to schools so people can get to those spaces uh, more uh, safely. You know, my kids literally ride their bikes or walk to and from school every day, and I sure want them to be able to cross those streets effectively. I also think there's um, some opportunities for partnerships between the Parks Bureau and um, and schools in terms of supporting youth recreational opportunities. Um, and here's one of the other things that I think is particularly important, um, and I do this a fair bit in the infrastructure space, is to provide um, internship opportunities for young folk uh, to come and do um, the city's work, to come and, you know, spend a summer working at uh, the Water Bureau or the Bureau of Environmental Services. I mean, I'll tell you, that is going to be incredibly important as we move into the next couple of years. Um, I know for the kids who are not on a college track, um, that was, you know, a deeply concerning thing a few years ago, but I will tell you, uh, right now we have so much infrastructure that we need to build in Portland over the next 20 years that I really want to encourage kids to explore the trades. Uh, so creating opportunities for youth to get exposed to that is important. And frankly, uh, one of the bottlenecks in our ability to um, grow as an economy in the coming just couple of years is literally gonna be finding enough folks uh, who um, are willing and have the skill sets that we need to you know, build a bridge to Vancouver or build the bridge across uh, the, across the Willamette River. So incredibly important stuff, uh, which is coming on right away. Okay, and then our last question is from Deanna. Our case managers work daily with people who are on SSDI, mm -hmm. fixed income community members, struggle to find housing that will allow them to thrive. Yeah. And many receive at most $1,500 a month. SSA is a disability to live on. Housing vouchers are few and far between for the need and not a reliable resource in the meantime, as it can take quite a while for their implementation. How would you support these community members? And thank you for your time. Well, you know, I think what, I I think the, the city's role here and the county's, well, let me just speak to the city's role. I think the um, one of the things that I think the city needs to do is to really lean into the housing voucher piece. Uh, the fact that there's not enough housing vouchers and it takes too long, uh, to get them out the door is a problem that actually city government and partnership with our uh, with our friends over at the county can make a real difference on. Um, so, you know, those are some of the spaces that I hope to lean into in our first uh, four years um, in the mayor's office. Okay. Well, Commissioner Maps, thanks so much for taking your uh, lunch hour with us. Uh, I just want to let everyone know uh, we're going to drop into the chat a link to our homelessness prevention strategy. And also remember, if you've got folks that wanted to tune in and were unable to, we'll have this recording up on our Impact Northwest YouTube channel to look at at any time after. And uh, I wanted to give you the, a moment just if you want to wrap up, Commissioner, before we close it out. Well, um, I very much appreciate uh, this forum and this dialogue. Um, when I'm your mayor, uh, should the people of Portland give me that opportunity, I also want to really reassure you that I'm going to have an open door uh, policy around um, fixing um, our housing challenges. Um, I know many of you folks are um, on the front lines. Um, the kind of leadership, the kind of kind of leadership I tried to bring to the city is the is to remove the barriers that prevent you folks from being effective. Uh, one of the things that I know and I've heard today um, is that you know your frontline workers need fair wages. I, um, I very much agree with that, and I will lean into that. We've already done that since it, in my time um, on council, and I will continue to do that. And, uh, you know, certainly within the, my first hundred hours as mayor, one of the things that you'll uh, see me do is to pull together 
folks who are on this call uh, to develop and update our strategies for housing our most vulnerable neighbors. Much appreciated. Thank you so much, Commissioner Maps, and thank you all for joining our call. We appreciate it. And thanks for taking your time out on our lunch. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.